Hello again, everyone. I am Steve, and welcome back to the best Q&A session on CRTs and Sony PVMs on the internet. And it may be the only one, but hey, we're still the best and the only one. So today I've got a list of a bunch of good questions. Some of them are combined. Uh, this is going over basically the last 10 weeks worth of work. And anybody that's also a newer subscriber that may have asked an interesting question and some other uh, patrons asked some really good questions. So today I want to go through those questions. I've also got some very interesting demos set up behind me. We'll kind of go through that as this video goes on and as we get to some of these questions in details. Uh, just for quick notes, I do have uh, the JVC video monitor here and I'll show you a little bit about it. And then I've got an Olympus OEV 142 here and we've got this two 8-inch Sony PVMs hooked up for some demo too. So let's just get right into these questions. And the first one comes from uh, a Patreon member, Brian Ritchie. And Brian asked, where'd you learn to do all the neat stuff you can do to CRTs in regards to repair and stuff? I'm very tech illiterate and haven't even soldered before. Your videos offer great insight, but I'm afraid to try these complex operations myself for fear of shock or burning through the board or otherwise ruining a good set some other way. Basically, I would really like some skills necessary to keep any of these sets I find going for a long time because the market won't get any better for CRTs and he doesn't imagine, and I can't imagine not using a CRT. I really like them and that's one of the main reasons I got into it is because there's just a lack of support and knowledge uh, on the subject, on even the internet, which is kind of surprising, but it was one of those technologies that a lot of people just left behind and didn't want to have anything do, to do with afterwards. So, how did I get to do CRT repairs that I do today? Well, that's a lot of steps and probably three or four years of uh, a lot of hard work and training myself. Uh, but to sum it up kind of nicely, uh, the first thing I started to repair and modify was video game consoles and specifically I started with Ataris because Ataris are very big a lot of room inside um, they have they're really cheap too uh, you can get capacitors and do parts replacements on them pretty easily with just a nice soldering iron so that's one of the things I do recommend if you're gonna get get a decent soldering iron with a temperature control like the Hacko unit you know, you've seen me use uh, and that way it's not it's not much more than a hundred bucks probably less now. It's not the top end, but it's a good starting soldering iron. So after I started just studying what I could online for uh, different build kits for video modification on Ataris and what other repairs and mods I could do to them, I eventually graduated from that and started working on other consoles that were more difficult like Nintendos, Super Nintendos, and N64s and then other things that were more complicated and I just after a few years of working on those and Game Boys even and other handhelds after working on some things like that and getting some practice with soldering I then decided to jump in and start working on CRTs so I learned to do it on stuff that doesn't matter and that way you can move from that to working on stuff that's really precise and you know needs you to be kind of confident in your skills so you don't have to be perfect at soldering but the more you do it the more comfortable you are and the more you learn about things like how to use flux properly and how to you know tip, little tips and tricks along the way of just working through it uh, going into this his question in the second half was about RGB modding a consumer TV owns and um, I think this is a great idea for people once you get to that point where you're ready to get into a TV and start working on one the first thing you want to do is just familiarize with how to safely take it apart and then once you've gotten it apart and um, you're looking at it then maybe go through and replace the capacitors and especially the ones around the um, heat sink which is the little metal plates inside on the chassis as well as the flyback definitely those capacitors but that gives you really good practice so then you replace the capacitors in that set and while you're doing that you have to go online and sometimes you have to do some serious digging for manuals and this goes to another question later so I won't get into it too much right now 
but you get into the you're gonna have to find the manual and then you find the uh, chips on the board and you see if an RGB mod is possible and then you can insert the RGB mod and you can use my guide they're all pretty similar so it's it just takes a lot of time watch a lot of videos a lot of practice don't get upset with yourself if you ruin something but just you know go in and start and make sure you just really are comfortable soldering pretty much and you can do that by working on things that aren't that important you know there's also a lot of cool little kits you can get to build things that are just like little LED kits and and different circuit board kits that you can build to help you practice soldering techniques because once you get that down uh, it, it, that's all just secondary nature and then you get in and you try to figure out what's wrong with the TV and just kind of replacing the parts or the monitor all right so that's a very long question but thank you Brian and uh, let's get on to some other things here okay and so the next question is from Jake Hughes another patreon member He's wondering if I could cover the best ways to do research to find diagrams for circuit boards. Uh, he's having some difficulties finding manuals for a specific Panasonic monitor. And for some reason he's having blue flare-ups on his RGB signals. So the blue flare-ups could be another number of things on that blue line. Could be something that's got a cold solder joint in the blue color. Uh, line where it's going from the processing chip up into the actual neck board into the tube. So that's a possibility. The blue tube gun could be going in and out and may need to be uh, recharged because that would be a shadow mask tube so it would have an individual gun for blue that could go out or one of the resistors or something on the neck board could need to either be resoldered or reflowed solder. Um, as far as finding diagrams and circuit boards, obviously the first place to check is the CRT wiki on Reddit for the CRT subreddit. And there's a listing of a lot of great manuals, but that doesn't have everything. So sometimes you just have to get in there and start digging through Google and you're going to end up at some shady sites. So I don't know that all those are necessary to go to, but you just have to keep trying. Sometimes you have to find similar models of a specific, especially if it's a consumer CRT and there's not a big database for your brands. Uh, uh, Nick Furlow had a question and he is another Patreon member and he says, I think it could be helpful to hear about what kind of wire you use, what equipment you use, where you source your parts, things of that nature. I'd also be interested in hearing your opinions on Extron equipment and maybe a couple videos in the future on how to build cables and adapters and that's all stuff that I definitely would be glad to work on I think that some of the past videos kinda of showing you where I have to get parts you know I still have to go to places like eBay for things uh, that I can't find at these other um, websites I use Mouser for individual capacitors and uh, any other small components I usually use them you can always use DigiKey if you just Google these sites, they're really big and trusted, and they do offer uh, good service as well as good products. As far as like wiring, I'm about to do another video where I'm going to do a console mod on a Super Nin or a Nintendo top loading NES. We put an RGB kit in there, and I've got new wiring, so I'm going to do all that. I'm going to cover a lot of that soldering stuff in that video and put links to that. That's all planned to come because I'm using different stuff than I have in the past. And um, let's see here, the Extron equipment. So I do have some Extron equipment. I have a bunch of Extron equipment, a bunch of weird Extron equipment. And Extron equipment is crazy. I mean, some of it's just random, does weird stuff, doesn't accept certain video signals. The crazy thing about Extron stuff is it was pretty much custom set up. Um, and it's not like the whole device was custom set up. They have like one device, but then you could choose what you wanted as far as inputs and outputs. So everything I get is secondhand from somebody else having a custom set up for some weird custom situation where they wanted videos to go in and out. However, today I do have a small demo with one of those Extron devices. So let's go ahead now and we'll go take a look at it. All right, so the first demo is an Extron demo. And what I've got here is a AV series matrix switcher. Now this is not a particularly desirable matrix switcher for video gaming 
because unfortunately this model, it's just a straight composite in and out model. However, they do make ones of these that will do RGB and they're about, you know, this much bigger. I mean, they're like five times larger than this because they have so many inputs and outputs. But this will still do the same functionality as that. It just does it on AV. And you might say, well, why, why do I have this? Well, this is actually used for um, installations and things that are just running mostly composite. So if you have just video format, you're not worried about people checking out um, details and getting really close, high up resolutions for analog video, then this is fine. So let's go ahead now and, and use this a little bit. So you can see we've got video and audio signals coming in. And uh, on the front here, we've got eight inputs and eight outputs. So first, um, let's take a, a look around back and go over what's going in and out. So here's the back of this Extron unit and let's just look at some of these things. You can see they're all using BNC inputs and outputs for video and then we've got just a standard uh, input cable for our power here. Now sometimes these devices will not use these standard cables. They'll have a proprietary external power supply or they'll use some other type of power uh, input cable set up and that is because this could be specifically changed if you wanted it to be, Extron would change it to a different type of power input. And you notice over here, these might be something that look a little foreign to most people. These are considered or called Phoenix connectors, and they are just audio connections that have different setups for ways to wire in your audio, but you have to use these to get audio in and out of some of these devices. As you can see on this one, I've actually got one set up here, I've got a Super, or, yes, a Super Nintendo going into this with actual stereo audio, stereo audio going in, excuse me, goodness, and stereo audio coming out over here. And we'll go through and show you some of that uh, now on the front side while I flip through some of the inputs and outputs. Okay, so I've got my Xtron ready. And right now, if I hit the number one, it'll show me what has video signals going into it and then for example if I press number one it shows me number one is going to outputs one two so you could have up to eight different video monitors or uh, any kind of capture device or even like VCR or something hooked up to the outputs on this and then you can control the inputs simultaneously send them to as many monitors or all um, you know different things at different times so number one I have the DVD player hooked up to that one. And if number two over here has monitors three and four, those are the smaller monitors, and that's got the Super Nintendo. So example, if I wanted um, all monitors to be playing the DVD, I hit the one, I hit the other two monitors, and then I just hit enter. And you can see right away it switches right over to all those being on the same. And then if you want, for example, say, well, I wanted the number two to have just that monitor, you could hit that one and press enter. And you see down there, it would just change that one over to the Super Nintendo. And you can do that vice versa. So that's a lot of fun. I really like these devices because there's no lag, nothing uh, really. You know, Once you get them set up, they're a lot of fun to play with. So that's kind of a short demo on how to function through a matrix switcher. All right, so again, look for more Extron equipment uh, reviews and demos coming up. I think I've got probably seven or eight different types of weird switches and uh, different kinds of the video scaling equipment that I'll be going over more depth this year. All right, our next question is, is there any way to repair scuffs in the coating of a CRT screen? This is very difficult um, to get off a screen. A, a, a scuff is... Sometimes you can't do anything about it. Sometimes if you rub hard enough, it ends up being something like Sharpie or some other type of residue. And so I thought sometimes that things were on the screen, they ended up being some kind of adhesive leftover and they would come off. So first off, just try to clean it, make sure it's not a scuff. If it's a genuine scuff, um, there are a few models of monitors that will have a protective film on the tubes uh, mostly shadow mask tubes but not even all those I mean a lot of them don't have it so if you you know like these PBMs like this do not have any type of coating on them 
None of these do. Now the higher end ones like a 20L5 and probably a 20L4 would. Um, and the BVMs probably do, but not these. So the only thing I was thinking of is maybe some type of um, lens kit for your eyeglasses, but I don't know. So that's an idea. If anybody has any suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. Or if you have a link to something that is some kind of uh, eyeglass repair kit, because I don't wear glasses and neither is anybody pretty much in my family, so I don't know where to look for it. But I think maybe that might be something to look into. Next, any chance you can do a repair video on a neck board where the color drives need to be replaced? Yes, I, I plan to do on some more repair videos coming up, but right now I don't have any that um, have that problem. So when one comes in, I'll definitely do a video on it and we'll try to redo it. Um, the thing is, is sometimes like it was with these two monitors, it just ends up being where the parts aren't even bad, uh, just they have cold solder joints. So I would always say just check the cold solder joints first, but if it's not working after that, then um, replacing you know, the parts on the neck board that are, you know, they'll say what color each line is. So if you have one color that's out, that you can tell, go in there and just replace those big resistor on there. There's a big resistor always, and then sometimes there's some um, components on heat sinks. You can replace those. Just read the parts on them, or if you find the manual, go and look at the, the board on the manual, and it'll tell you exactly what the specification is for the part. And you can order it and replace it, and it's pretty much good as good, good as new, but I will do that when they come up. All right, next question. If your TV isn't connected to anything and just sits there on the table, uh, where does the electricity go when you discharge the tube? It dissipates in the chassis. If so, what happens if you're touching it and you're discharging it? So this goes back to the rules I talk about in the safety videos. When you discharge a tube, don't be touching anything else with your other hand. Like I, sometimes I will have to hold up that little rubber cap but I'm making sure I'm not touching anything else and that rubber cap is completely rubber and it's still a risk on my end, but I don't really want to damage my tube. So, you know, lift that and then you can do it or don't touch anything. Keep your hand out of the way because you don't want to be holding any part of that metal ground loop in that frame uh, when that little zap goes through. But you got to remember, this is not current that's constantly going in there. It's just some stored current. So it will quickly ground out to that metal and then dissipate throughout itself and ground out into the earth, you know, just down, just through itself, ground out, you know, through the whole frame and chassis and all that steel. You don't want to be touching it, but it's just that quick burst of electricity because it's not continuous where it activates live electricity on that metal that stays continuous. It just flows out and gets weak and just, you know, separates off like electricity will do. So... You don't have to worry about, again, discharging it into some kind of ground wire on the floor or in the ground or in your home or anything like that. Just put it on the frame and keep your hand, do the one pocket rule. Keep one hand in the pocket and one hand on the TV when you're working on it. Then after you discharge it, don't worry about it. Just keep it unplugged and undischarged and you can do anything with it. It's completely safe pretty much at that point. All right, what is the reference uh, SNES tool game you use? So I get this question all the time, and it's right here on this screen and this screen, and I showed you, you know, switching back and forth on the screens on the Xtron Switch demo. But this screen's on this 240p test pattern, and I can't tell you how many times, just Google 240p test suite. It's, it's on a lot of different formats. You can get it for your computer file or some kind of file if you load from anything that's a EverDrive, you need to have one, probably EverDrive or some type of multi-cart that you can load a program onto. That way you can get the program on the screen and then you can just roll through it and it's got all those great test patterns in it. There's been plenty of great videos on how awesome the 240p test suite is. I just happen to use it for Super Nintendo because that's the one I like the best. Uh, but it's also on uh, a bunch of other systems and even if you have a disc-based system, you can get it on like a Dreamcast disc, and it's compatible with a Dreamcast or anything else that um, that's on the, the site for the 240p test suite. 
Next question, is there any place to get convergence strips anymore? Yes, there is an eBay seller who's come up with making some of his own convergence strips. So they look like they're, you know, homemade. Um, I mean, they look very made fine. So just if, if you want to try those out, I did get a link to that in my last video. I'll try, if I can find it, I'll put it below. But if you'd probably get on eBay right now and find kits of uh, convergence strips, I think they were $10 plus shipping. All right, let's talk about some more stuff here. I have a PVM, but the top right slants down on the side and it's curved. Um, one side is curved, but the other is not. Any idea on this problem? So I think what I've been talking about this problem too, uh, where you know I have a CRT and one of the the uh, you know it'll it'll be fine and flat against one surface, and then one of the surfaces is straight curve so sometimes it's just got to do with your magnetism and it can be the yoke um, either not spreading the magnetism properly anymore maybe you're having uh, a little bit of weak issues with the yoke and not getting enough ohms or some kind of electricity so that would be something to check with a multimeter uh, or the yoke itself may not be positioned correctly so you can go look at my purity and convergence video I did couple weeks back uh, but that's what you have to do you have to get in behind that uh, CRT and I'll show you that in a demo I'm coming up for another question a little bit more but you know you have to get in there and move that yoke around uh, sometimes it'll be pointed up or down a little bit and it causes a, a bow in the center of the screen too it looks kind of funny I've seen that before if you if you get your service manual for your uh, monitor or CRT the actual service manual please just go look in that and look towards the third the back third of the manual and it will have in there generally how to adjust the CRT's yoke assembly and it looks a little confusing but just start looking at it and think about what it's telling you to do on turning the yoke aim it in certain ways and that way it'll help you get those lines straightened out I've still got some more work I have to do again on that large Sony KV because the yoke is just not right on it and it's not sitting right and it's still driving me crazy on certain things in my den. So I'll make a video again on that in the future when I have it out and I'm working on it. Alright, next question. How important is sound quality for PVMs? Uh, not internal speakers but external speakers, recommendations. So I'm going to do a video on this because you definitely don't want to use these little mono you know, speakers on there. I just use them to test things and make sure I'm getting a signal, especially when I have just a, working on a PVM. They're good for that. They're good for getting individual sound for something, but they only have a mono speaker, so they're not really that good. But I'll look for an in-depth video on that. What I can tell you for now is uh, you want to get some kind of good stereo set up, basically, probably just two speakers. Um, and you can get an old AV receiver and just run audio through that. I'll cover that more in that video. Extrons, some Extrons have scaling devices that have built-in stereo amps. Some PVMs like a 2950, 2530, 2030, 2130, those have built-in stereo amplifiers so you can actually just put speakers, uh, stereo speakers right into the back of them. So look for that video. Make sure if you're looking at a speaker that it's well shielded. It's also going to have a good heavy weight to the magnet uh, for good sound. If you're looking for a good speaker, you want to look for a good dense weight. But you also want to check and see if it's shielded. You can generally do that by, if you can open up the shell of the speaker and look at the back, you can see if there's a big metal uh, heavy plate over it. If there isn't, then it's probably going to have exposed magnetism that will definitely warp in, in your image and give you color purity problems that you don't want to deal with. So look for that in the future. Um, but that's it for that. So my last question for the day is, is it possible to cover more horizontal bowing, like I talked about a little bit with the yoke, on Sony consumer flat screens? Well, unfortunately, I don't have any Sony flat CRT sets. I just don't have them. Um, Anyway, he's looking at some problems with his deflection yoke adjustment and what's involved. Well, I mean, it's again, that color purity video I did is what you have to do. You have to spin your yoke. You have to use um, tilt the yoke, refer to your manual for your TV and, and do what it says for yoke adjustment. 
but we're also going to do a little demo and look at magnetism effects on this smaller PVM right now. I've got it opened up. I've got some magnets and some other cool little things. We'll talk about magnetism because that's ultimately the issue here. If something is not right with the magnetism pattern as it's related to the electrons hitting you know, the phosphors in the screen, so your screen's just not got the right magnetism proportionally on it to display the image in the correct format or the correct dimensions that you want. So let's go ahead now and we'll take a look at this uh, PVM for a quick demo. All right, for the next demo, we're going to be looking at this 8-inch PVM. And we're going to be talking a little bit about magnetism. I want to show you some magnetic effects uh, when I use some magnets on the back side of the CRT and what happens on the front screen. But before we get started on that, this is the 240p test suite, which was uh, questioned earlier is what is it well this is it again use this if you have access to any kind of uh, everdrive or multi-cart that you can load software on or any kind of pi device that you might play retro video games on so first let's get in here and look at some of these test patterns and one of the better ones to show you is going to be a grid pattern and we'll go with the smaller grid now Magnetism um, that's on inside this is trying to do a number of things. It's going to be spreading our screen out um, to you know the orientation we want it for our geometry, but the magnetism is also trying to control the colors on here so we don't end up with a lot of discoloration and weird impurity on our screen. This screen right here is very good for obviously measuring your geometry and uh, how your screen tilt is concerned and maybe even convergence in the corners as well as yoke uh, adjustments that you may need. But um, if, we, if we see there's also some things in the back here, let's take a quick look around the back of this monitor and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Looking back here at the tube, you can see this is a convergence strip, okay? And then in there is our yoke, and it's it's got these wedges that it's sitting up against. Um, so that's helping it sit in the right spot, and it's not tilting or leaning. Uh, you really have yoke problems only on larger monitors. And also convergence and other issues, the problems get bigger on the larger monitor. So smaller monitor like this can get near perfect geometry relatively easy. But when you get into a 20 plus inch screen is when it's hard to get the magnetism even through the entire uh, corners and everything. So let's look again on the back of this tube. You can see up here, this is a purity magnet. And this was installed at the factory. And what it is, is just a small magnet and this one happens to be a rectangle. Usually they're round and you'll see them on double-sided tape on the back. And that purity magnet is affecting the color purity most likely right in this spot right in here. So no, so what might have happened is this probably came out of the factory floor, hit like the test area and the setup area and the tech who was working on it in the factory probably noticed a little um, color impurity in this area and threw a, this magnet on the back side because usually whenever whatever's going on here the magnetism is affecting it just on the opposite side of where it is on the back so I've got a magnet here and this is a round magnet and it's about 10 times bigger than a purity magnet but with it I can manipulate a lot of things on the screen to kind of show you what I mean by magnetism and how it affects a lot of stuff so you can see how the introduction of that magnetism changes colors on the screen up here and it affects the areas where I'm putting that magnet. So that's why I'm saying when you do an adjustment, you try to get magnetism fixed, you, you, whatever corner is messed up, go to that opposite corner inside the tube and work on it in that corner. Whether it's a converge, like if I had an issue in this corner, I want to look for the convergence strip on the back side hitting that area. Uh, under, same thing, under, and you know, each corner, stuff like that. That's where those strips come in. And then when you, you know, move that yoke, you can see the horizontal axis. It's, I mean, that's pretty easy to get that tied up. The problem is when the yoke is drifting and it's back further than it is, needs to be. It's not pushed up fully against the back of the tube and those wedges 
So it has a little play in it and it'll end up with a warp through the middle or warps down towards the bottoms and especially might get some trouble down here and it was a real problem on larger monitors. So again, let's maybe go to a color screen so I can show you some more on this magnetism. Let's go with, let's see if I, if I show you on this linearity, you'll be able to see it too. How when I, when I hit that with the magnet, it really just shows you how much the magnetism affects it in each corner. So there's a good demo on that. Now you can also affect magnetism further back on the tube. So what I'm, I'll show you what I mean there now. See how it's getting wobbly, a little bit different. You're not getting convergence, but you're getting a different wobble. That's from when you get the magnet near the actual yoke assembly. So if you get that magnet along that, you know, that uh, yoke ring, it can impact anything basically because your your magnetic field is generated by that yoke assembly around your CRT neck and uh, the rest of the tube and just falls up so the rest of the tubes up here is just for correcting your signal pretty much so I hope that demo helps a little bit um, look for some more maybe calibrations and tips on this particular monitor in the future uh, but again if you if you just you, unfortunately just check your uh, mo monitors or TVs uh, service manual on the best practices for doing a yoke assembly adjustment uh, but it is a, a tedious and manual job um, and and often takes you know patience especially working on convergence and things because it can be tricky and uh, frustrating if you don't get it you know right the first time all right everyone thanks again for sitting through this long video I really appreciate um, all the great questions Please look for some more great repair videos and mod videos and other things coming up. And feel free to shoot me either an email or a comment on any of the videos with some questions. And if, it's, uh, if you pay attention to next time, I'll put some announcements about when I do the Q&A videos. And you can reply to those uh, posts and have your question answered on the next Q&A session. But thanks again for watching. Have a wonderful day.